so again, welcome. And um, I'm really excited that we have today with us uh, Dr. Bruno Thornheim, um, who will be speaking about destabilization and sustainability transitions. Bruno um, was trained in industrial ecology at Chalmers University and then in also in general purpose engineering um, at the Ecole des Mines de Douai in France. He then went on to do a PhD at SPRU at the University of Sussex on the destabilization of exi existing regimes in socio-technical transitions. So he's uh, been with this topic for a very long time already. He then went on to do postdoctoral research in the Pathways Project uh, at King's College London. And since 2020, he's now leading um, the research project Ways Out at LISIS in Paris, which is the inter interdisciplinary laboratory on science, innovations, and societies. Also that in France. Um, Bruno's research um, mostly focuses on destabilization processes in sustainability transitions and also historical socio-technical transitions in different sectors such as energy, mobility, and food. But there's also another strand of research that's on public policies for tackling grand societal challenges. Uh, so all of that makes me really excited for today's talk and I now hand over to you, Bruno. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, is my screen shared? Not yet, okay. Excuse me. Bear with me a second, here we are. Working now? Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, th I wanna thank the organizers, uh, the Nest Network, which I think is an amazing network and very important for the community. Uh, thanks Leo for the introduction and thank you all participants. I can't see how many you are, but I've seen that there were a lot of us. Um, Obviously, we're here to talk about destabilization. I believe this is an important topic. Uh, as Leo has said, this was uh, the topic, the object of my thesis at SPRU. Uh, I left the topic for uh, a while and then came back to it now with a vengeance, I hope, uh, in this uh, brand new uh, project where we'll be lo looking at uh, systematic comparisons, uh, more conceptual elaborations, etc., on uh, socio-technical destabilization. Voilà. So, see. Voilà. So this is uh, the overview of what uh, I have uh, in stock for you today. A fairly simple uh, plan program. So why, uh, what is destabilization? How to research it? Uh, how it can be researched? And and I'll finish with. Uh, with some remarks on the where uh, future research is heading and might be heading. But before I get to this, I wanted to uh, give, I guess, uh, share some personal views about the field of transition studies. I'll do this right now. So I believe, and I'm not the only one, that there are two uh, sort of stances and currents in transition studies. Uh, from its inception and, and currently too. Uh, sustainability transitions on the one hand and socio-technical transitions on the other. And to illustrate this, uh, these stances could be seen as the cook stance and the critic stance. And I'll get uh, explain why and how I see this. So on the one hand, sustainability transitions uh, current is concerned with how to foster sustainability transitions to address wicked social problems, societal and environmental problems. The, it starts from uh, a diagnosis that uh, systems, current systems are locked in and hence uh, to overcome the tendencies for purely incremental innovation, there's a focus on developing, fostering, nurturing radical alternatives. On the other hand, the socio-technical strand is interested, well, starts from a diagnosis that historically socio-technical transitions have happened, so they can happen. The question is how, and what are the dynamics, the mechanisms, etc. cetera. Uh, the focus is more on socio-technical matters, so uh, more in tune perhaps with the roots, the SCS roots of the field, but also with an interest in history. And the core questions are uh, questions of stability and change for which destabilization is very 
central. Um, on, in sustainability transitions research, the focus tends to be on the emergence, the development of uh, sustainable innovation and a lot of co-creation action research, for instance. Uh, there's always a background normative orientations towards which researchers have or uh, more or less reflexive stances. So one can think of this strand as a more engaged, uh, committed uh, to solving environmental and sustainability problems. And, and you know, to one extreme, uh, this could be seen as potentially naive. Uh, on the other hand, socio-technical the socio-technical strand is mobilizing historical cases a lot or has been doing so uh, for a while, is focusing on analyzing uh, patterns and crafting typologies. And, and perhaps the, the stance is more one of, of taking perhaps a, a, a more perspective and, and on the, let's say, uh, the extreme version of that is, is perhaps a cynical uh, view can become a cynical view on transitions. Obviously, these two strands are completely intertwined and most scholars adopt both. I really like this paper in the first uh, issue of uh, EIST, uh, wrote by, uh, written by René Kemp and Harold van Lente, who really talk about the dual challenge of sustainability transitions as one of uh, fostering socio-technical change, as well as providing clear direction uh, uh, towards sustainability. So really a dual challenge for uh, transition studies. To continue my reflection on transition studies, I think we can see two ways of representing transitions. One will be the hopeful one and the other one will be the monstrous one, mobilizing this uh, well uh, used metaphor of hopeful monstrosities that we see with uh, Joel Mokir, the uh, historian. So the hopeful strand uh, tends to be very focused on novelty. Uh, you see these depictions of bright futures that renewables uh, uh, bear. Uh, and this is often opposed to a gloomy past or a gloomy present that has to be overturned, right? And, and we know uh, this, and there's obviously an emphasis on solutions. On the other hand, uh, another representation of transition is one of uh, socio-technical systems as potentially monstrous, something that we know very well from the sociology and history of technology. Uh, and this strand, this sort of representation would emphasize uh, problems with established socio-technical orders or systems. Problems with systems and technologies, for instance, uh, uh, traffic jams and pollution related to the car, problems with rules and institutions, uh, for instance, uh, the drive for automation uh, and industrialization bearing uh, significant problems, but also problems uh, emanating from specific particular strategies of particular actors, notably incumbent actors, which we can represent here by uh, various uh, ways of capturing uh, emerging uh, solutions, sustainable solutions. So now I come uh, to why study destabilization. So the first one uh, is really to correct what uh, some authors have seen as a novelty bias uh, in uh, transition studies. Uh, with Benjamin Sovacool, we've written a, a paper recently on, on failures in as a sustainability transitions, and we've identified four typical biases in transition uh, uh, studies, uh, notably to do with the mobilization of cases of and evidence. So the, we identify a selection bias, the cases that we select tend to be hopeful, heroic winners. We focus on the emergence of uh, and the success of certain uh, innovations. A cognitive bias because failure is much harder, more difficult to see and grasp than success. An interpretation uh, bias, uh, ruling out uh, for the sake of simplicity of our stories, ruling out uh, the losers perhaps of innovation, the failures, the problems along the way, etc. And a prescriptive bias, which has to do with or contact as a community with decision making and governance, wherein we are often squeezed into mobilizing cases for uh, 
an aspiration of value rather than uh, emphasizing uncertainties, problems, tensions. And this, we uh, uh, argue, is uh, a problem that should be corrected within the field. And I think uh, a lot of steps are, are being done in the right di direction. So how does this link to destabilization? So in transition studies, one could say that destabilization is at the same, uh, at the same time everywhere and nowhere. In the foundational papers and, and books, destabilization is mentioned as uh, windows of uh, generating windows of opportunities as essential for transitions to happen. Yet, until recently, it hasn't been the primary focus of uh, research. So we can say it's a neglected topic and it still endures uh, to this day. Uh, despite a growing interest in destabilization, we see that uh, uh, the scale is still weighing very much on the side of emphasizing novelty, as these quotes uh, illustrate, in different uh, uh, traditions, actually, not only in our uh, field. So why study destabilization? So the first one we've covered, addressing novelty biases, this argument of the flip side of transition, flip side of novelty in transition. The other one is a diagnosis that in transition, some degree of destabilization is inevitable, not only in substitution paths and, and pathways, uh, to some extent, something will die or something will erode or uh, or fall into a, a lesser order of priority. Another argument is that uh, transitions inv involve struggles and conflicts. So uh, destabilization to focus on the blood, sweat, tears involved in transitions, which we shouldn't be naive about, that obviously exist. Similarly, in transitions, there are winners and losers. So emphasizing and understanding the perspective of losers sounds paramount. Destabilization is linked to a core uh, concept in transition studies, that of the lock-in of social technical systems, which tends to produce path insistence and rule out uh, hopeful alternatives. So, from that diagnosis, uh, one can delve into destabilization with the motivation of unlocking and searching, creating, uh, contributing to the development of windows of opportunity. And more recently, and this is more in the public sphere rather than purely in the research uh, field, uh, phase out has emerged as an object of governance with uh, dedicated strategies. And this is particularly interesting because we now have, you know, uh, a lab, uh, uh, an, an open uh, uh, societal lab to, to be look, looking at. Another reason uh, is that of uh, the role of crises, and obviously we're all uh, living one today, but uh, destabilization uh, invites us to think uh, more thoughtfully about and more deeply about crises, their role in transitions, their role in destabilization. Is it the same or not? And, and I will come to some of the important ambiguities between crisis and destabilization. And lastly, a more conceptual endeavor is uh, one to uh, develop uh, conceptual apparatus uh, as much as has been done for stabilization and development of innovation and transitions towards and direct these conceptual elaborations towards destabilization. And we'll see that stabilization, destabilization, sorry, is not purely the reverse of stabilization. It involves different processes, different mechanisms. I want to evoke that one of these last motives for uh, destabilization research, and this is that we are witnessing currently uh, the increasing importance of destabilization as an object of governance. So for STS scholars or political scientists, it's particularly interesting to see how destabilization and phase out is becoming constituted as an object of governance. We see here different agendas, different missions, different policy governance obje uh, objectives 
around phasing out, phasing out pesticides, keeping the coal in the ground, divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, related to that are considerable difficulties setting these uh, policies and governance uh, uh, endeavors into motion because there are significant problems associated with it. Uh, keeping coal in the ground means uh, uh, detracting thousands, tens of thousands of people alone in Europe from, from jobs and dealing with uh, deprived uh, former coal regions, anticipating these problems. And of course, we've seen in the past, and this was the object, one of the cases in my, my thesis, that uh, uh, destabilization projects, destabilization governance projects are not necessarily tied to sustainability. Uh, the acceleration of the destabilization of coal mining in the UK during the 20th century was really accelerated by this neoliberal project uh, uh, for which the heroic figure is Margaret Thatcher. There is no such thing as society, only individuals, families, etc. So this was motivated, this, this is a case of destabilization motivated by other kinds of ideals, perhaps less uh, hopeful uh, now that we have uh, more historical perspective on them. So, what is then destabilization? Can we define it? And what would be its uh, core elements? So I've tried myself to, to generate a tentative definition and, and this has all its possible flaws. We could define socio-technical destabilization as a longitudinal process, I really want to insist on process, uh, by which otherwise relatively stable socio-technical forms forms that are locked in, but these socio-technical forms can be systems, regimes, institutional arrangements, sets of practices, networks. Um, so a process whereby these socio-technical forms become exposed to challenges that are significant enough to threaten their continued existence and their normal functioning. Voilà. So destabilization in such a definition can be distinguished from related notions of discontinuation, of phase out, and exnovation. And I'll come to that immediately. So, how do we disambiguate this uh, terminology? So, we can see on, the, I've put here on the right hand of the slide, two, uh, uh, two dimensions. On the, on the red dimension, we see uh, analytical units going from smaller at the bottom to, to bigger, bigger uh, socio-technical orders uh, on, at the top, and an arrow going from lesser intentionality to uh, more intentionality as something to be deliberately governed. So destabilization and decline can be almost seen as more natural or objectifiable uh, processes. And on the other extreme, exnovation and innovation through withdrawal uh, can be seen as uh, active, deliberate uh, motives and ways of governing uh, technology and socio-technical systems. And with that comes this, uh, in most cases, a focus on ever smaller units. So we're talking about the exnovation of particular artifacts, substances, uh, practices rather than entire socio-technical systems. And I'll come back to what questions this uh, raises a little bit later. But to be a bit more detailed about the relevant or possible units, uh, uh, analytical units that are also analytical entry points uh, for the study of destabilization, what is being destabilized? What is the object of destabilization? It could be socio-technical systems. This is the kind of research that I am trying to do. So destabilization of uh, coal-based energy systems, conventional farming, uh, aviation, civil aviation, uh, whaling, uh, the ice trade and uh, societies dependent on that, uh, slavery even possibly. The destabilization of specific actors, so zooming in on the role of particular actors, we'll get to the role of incumbent actors later. The destabilization, perhaps the exnovation or phase out of particular substances, a lot of that around chemicals, but also plastic bags, tobacco, uh, the internal combustion engine, etc. 
destabilization of institutions. This is obviously important in, in various institutionalism uh, schools, uh, deregulation, delegitimation, but also the sort of gradual erosion of uh, trade unions and political representation of, of laborers. The destabilization of knowledge regime, and my project will look into that, and I find that particularly exciting. So epistemic communities and forms of expertise who are in the face of the new challenges that we collectively face, uh, becoming destabilized as their kinds of knowledge and expertise produced may uh, become less relevant. The role of crises, I'll come back to that, uh, often equated with destabilization, but uh, I will try to argue that uh, these are very, they are different. They uh, can contribute to each other, but in very, in particular circumstances. And the destabilization of political regimes, empires, the whole literature on stars, uh, the destabilization of particular ideologies. So I did a very quick uh, search on relevant uh, papers within transition studies dealing with uh, some of these terms, destabilization, decline, phase out, discontinuation, etc., and found that it's a growing strand of research, uh, really expanding. Uh, it has the similar pitfalls uh, that most transition studies has, has. That means, for instance, that a, a, a strong focus on energy, and this is not really surprising given the importance of the political project of, of coal and nuclear phase out. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, research on current destabilization. Again, the phase out agenda is, is influencing this. And the, the unit or the territorial scale at which this tends to be analyzed is, is rather national. Again, not entirely uh, surprising. And what is really nice to see is that uh, I can count at least half a dozen of research projects uh, in Europe, but certainly there are well beyond many projects focusing currently on destabilization, a growing number of PhD theses, etc. So it's, it's really an exciting area to be researching, and I'm, I'm very glad about that. Now to the house, and this will be the... Uh, so I'll, I'll, this, this is what I'll, I'll spend most time on. So how can we characterize socio-technical destabilization? What are the mechanisms, dynamics? Uh, what are the ways and forms of governance uh, of destabilization? Very quickly, and I've already uh, pointed to that, I'll, I'll just list a few relevant literatures and, and then delve into five conceptual entry points in, in greater detail. So without dwelling into uh, the particular literatures, what I really want to insist on here and, uh, is, is the huge variety of possible building blocks to uh, mobilize uh, in order to study destabilization. So I really want to encourage everyone their uh, conceptual curiosity and to look beyond transition studies to bring back and feed transition studies and, and questioning around these important uh, problems. Policy studies, STS literature, the social construction of technology, practice theory, institutional theories, social movement theory, obviously very important because of social mobilization and contestation, political nature of this problem organizational change and management at the level of firms, but also entire industries. Economic geography, as we'll see, the instruments of governance are perhaps more regionalized than they uh, have been or are in more conventional innovation governance. And questions of history and politics that are extremely exciting, relevant, and so far only partly mobilized in transition studies. So again, I want to encourage curiosity and breadth of reading to feed into our collective agenda of research. So I will go one by one through these five uh, conceptual entry points, which I see as uh, the main uh, say nexuses around which uh, to think destabilization currently in transition studies. I'll talk for each of these about some of the key issues and uh, 
some of the analytical strategies that can flow from this. So starting with uh, lock-in and inertia. So that's a classic uh, element of transition studies. It's pretty much the starting point of all transition studies. Uh, I think we can distinguish between two kinds of lock-ins. On the one hand, structural forms of lock-ins, uh, structural determinisms and constraints, hard constraints at play. Um, and on the other hand, more enacted forms of lock-ins. So structural lock-ins, we have economic dimensions, so uh, very well rehearsed facts about economies of scales, sunk cost standardization that progressively lock particular industries, regime sets of practices into doing more of the same and this tendency for incrementalism and locking alternative, more radical alternatives out of uh, existing paths. Socio this happens also on socio-political dimensions. So through discourses, mainstreaming of discourses, of ideologi ideologies, of practices, through uh, cognitive uh, routines, mindsets, etc. So what these do is uh, they lock existing systems and practices in path in path dependencies, and they constrain alternatives, they rule them out, they tend to uh, yeah, rule them out and, and favor uh, innovation strategies oriented towards incrementalism, incremental improvements. Lock-in is also enacted and, and most visibly by incumbent strong powerful actors in two main ways. Uh, first, they tend to maintain infrastructures, uh, continuously investing in railway infrastructures, for instance, if we're interested in the rail regime, in the training of, of uh, laborers, in uh, continuous legitimation of these practices. It's very important for the car industry to con entertain, continue reproducing these ideals of freedom, autonomy around the car and individual mobility, for instance. But there's also more active strategic resistance. We're really talking about industrial strategies and corporate strategies here, uh, lobbying uh, and continued investments to make sure that uh, the current established technologies remain uh, the norm. So in terms of analytical strategies, two uh, primary strategies. One is, I think it's really important to analyze the inner workings of sta stabilization of these systems. So go back into how these established systems have formed and the mechanisms that have allowed that, as well as the effects, what this produces in terms of lock-in, um, but also uh, to analyze regime stability as a uh, relatively potentially precarious uh, um, equilibrium, uh, analyze the coherence of regimes over time, their possible erosions, the cracks and tensions uh, that might appear through particular events uh, and contestations, for instance. This brings me neatly to the second entry point of sources of change. So I think this is also very important for destabilization is to recognize the multi-dimensional nature of sources of change of different pressures that can uh, that, that are exerted on existing regimes which in conventional stable times uh, are not seen as threats but can in a process of destabilization turn into very significant challenges so again we can distinguish techno-economic uh, types of pressures, uh, technological discontinuities, accidents, failures, technical failures uh, of systems, uh, the erosion of performance or services, crowded out trains, etc. For instance, if we're looking at trains, uh, uh, traffic jams, uh, sort of in preventing this ideal of freedom associated with with the car uh, to, to prevail, but also more competitive uh, dynamics, uh, which uh, Schumpeter has uh, uh, studied as and framed as creative destruction. Uh, so competitive dynamics that uh, can lead to certain firms to uh, lose over others. 
There are also uh, institutional uh, types of sources of change, um, delegitimation of certain practices, uh, challenges uh, on the air, poll air pollution or climate related challenges that uh, put pressures on industries to do something about them. Uh, the emission scandal with uh, uh, Volkswagen is, is quite interesting in this regard as air pollution was a significant pressure that should have led the company and car manufacturers in general to uh, substantially improve uh, the emissions of their vehicles or orient themselves towards zero or low emission vehicles but in somehow in in uh, in the process uh, uh, some gaming uh, happened regulations can exert significant pressures on industries and regimes uh, for change and of course uh, actors are very central in uh, destabilization pressures uh, social and political mobilization we can talk about environmental movements putting pressure on uh, existing uh, regimes with various kinds of strategies, soft strategies, but also violent, legal, non-legal strategies, etc. And we've seen, and this is very interesting in a recent paper by Steen and Weaver, uh, the disbanding of networks and alliances. So we can see destabilization from the perspective of um, established industrial actors and the collectives that they form in normal times eventually become eroded. Some, some actors will say, well, you know, uh, they will disband and change the rules uh, through uh, diversification strategies, for instance, which some other actors and, and eventually potentially entire industries would follow. So what is interesting to analyze in terms of the pressures for change is uh, to recognize a huge variety of types of pressures and to really characterize them, to follow these pressures lovingly over time as uh, pressures mount or, or fade away and, and, uh, uh, over time, how different kinds of pressures may interact, uh, sometimes forming perfect storms, but in other times, uh, becoming more heterogeneous and, and uh, confusing, not, not setting a clear path for change and destabilization. And I think it's also important when uh, type to characterizing different kinds of pressures is to look into their temporal pattern. And, and here, I, I really like this distinction that Andy Sterling makes between shocks and stresses. Shocks has punctual and temporally situated uh, yet very intense kind of changes of, ex of pressures uh, versus more slow, gradual uh, stresses. And sometimes these combine, and, and, and I think this is really interesting. Now to incumbent actors. So uh, the elephant in the room, uh, as to, so to say. Incumbent actors are uh, very important in destabilization research. Uh, they can be qualified as actors having a central position uh, and mastering power and resources in a particular regime. But it's also interesting to uh, recognize the variety of roles, motivations, and strategic action that different so-called so incumbent actors may have. So within an industrial or strategic action field, there might be more heterogeneity than the notion of regime uh, lends uh, to it. And recently, a very interesting paper by Andy Sterling on uh, pluralizing these forms of incumbency, looking at different actors, but also different depths of, of incumbencies at play. What a kind of analytical strategies uh, do we have to study uh, incumbent actors? I think a fundamental level is looking into the variety and the enactment of particular strategies by incumbent actors that can range from denial, resistance to change, to, you know, making bets, diversifying, uh, investing in alternative branches, uh, see how it, this goes. There's a whole literature in organizational change about the ambidexterity of uh, certain firms, which is 
not uh, uh, given to any kind of firm. Uh, other strategies might be to transform or to blatantly uh, accept uh, to retreat and decline. But in many cases, and we see not that many, but it's growing, uh, cases of destabilization where actually destabilization should happen, but it, or we, we would want to think that it should happen, but it doesn't happen. And this is uh, resistant, su successful resistance to destabilization. So stories of continuity rather than transition and change. So I've, I've mentioned uh, that regime commitments, so the commitment to the particular rules and institution that form a regime can vary over time, can vary within fields. And we can see all sorts of, of uh, dynamics of disbanding of collectives. We can also see uh, patterns, uh, strategic pa patterns of downward spirals, because obviously when industrial actors, for instance, are facing an increasing and, and lasting amount of pressures. Uh, this is repercuted on their organizational slack, the resources that they have available, and eventually a vicious circle uh, can uh, create and, and, and lead to organizational decline. But we might also think of more orderly paths of uh, destabilization, planned, managed decline of organization or entire systems. And I think this is the kind of things that governance uh, should be uh, anticipating. This leads me to processes, trajectories and mechanisms of destabilization. So here really in the tradition of transition studies, I just wanted to uh, remind uh, ourselves that what we are interested in is the modalities and conditions of change. So we're focusing on sequences of change, uh, process theory, rather than variance theory that might want to attribute uh, the effect of sets of variables on an independent variable. Destabilization, as I said in the introduction, is a process and should be studied as such. So events, activities, choices, strategic action will all combine and articulate in uh, sequences uh, to uh, develop into particular destabilization paths. So how might we study these processes, trajectories and mechanisms? Um, in transition studies, we have uh, significant efforts to develop typologies. Uh, I've here uh, uh, written references to some of the famous ones. Uh, Adrian Smith and colleagues uh, have focused, for instance, on uh, uh, on transition typologies uh, based on the locus of action and the resources available. While uh, Frank Eels and Johan Schott have uh, developed a typology of four transition pathways based on the nature of change and the timing of change. So that's, that's an available, available strategy, a very relevant one. Another one, with uh, Strake and Talen, political scientists, comparative political scientists have developed uh, to study uh, institutional decline is to contrast on the one hand, the types of change, whether it's preserving orders or changing orders with uh, the types uh, or the object of change, whether it's the form of systems or their structure. And this creates other kinds of typologies. And I think this is very relevant for destabilization research, uh, leads them to develop uh, sort of to uh, formulate paths like institutional exhaustion, institutional drifts, and, and is, is, is very interesting into the, uh, yeah, the different degrees of, of intentionality of destabilization paths. Uh, they, they famously see inaction in the face of change as a particular form of action. And I think that's, that's very interesting. When we're thinking of processes and mechanisms, I think we should recognize multiple and nested temporalities. Uh, and this will lead me eventually to discuss the com complexion of crises. So here a famous quote of Fernand Baudel, a French historian who conversed a lot with the social sciences suggest that the short-term perspective is always the most distorting and unpredictable lens through which to, so to view social realities. And so in 
within the MLP, we have these nested temporalities represented. I think we should bear them in mind when thinking about destabilization. So the landscape changes, the uh, regime changes, and, and, and what goes on in the niches is one way of looking at it. But a, at a higher level of generality, uh, longue durée, these landscape uh, secular changes, conjectures, uh, economic trends, uh, industrial patterns, patterns of practice, and on the very lower level, these events, which are notoriously hard uh, to understand what they're, to grasp and to, to analyze in terms of their consequences on these long-term processes. In terms of processes, again, if we are to develop typologies, we might want to think about uh, the temporality of change. So we might see gradual erosion patterns. We might see accelerated uh, dynamics of uh, destabilization, but we might also see interrupted paths, a destabilization about to happen, but for some reason uh, is uh, reversed. So uh, this uh, sort of invites caution, for instance, uh, when uh, one is today sort of uh, tempted to already um, write uh, uh, and analyze the consequences of the COVID crisis, for instance, on the aviation sector, which is currently at pretty much a, of a standstill. What does that tell us about the destabilization to come or not to come of the civil aviation? So again, here in thinking about processes of change and trajectories of destabilization, I invite really to think back uh, to uh, the dynamics, the mechanisms of stabilization, not to mirror their images, but to uh, um, become perhaps uh, inspired into how these notions uh, are conceptually elaborated. And this is now to my last point of our entry point, conceptual entry point, that of governance. The question of governing destabilization is whether and how uh, one might deliberately govern destabilization. Something that is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, very much visible in the current agendas of phase out being floated. So uh, borrowing from Susanna Boras and Jakob Edler, the book on the governance of uh, science, technology and innovation systems, we could look at governance uh, problems as three kinds of problems, uh, interlinked uh, problems, who and what drives change. So what are the agents and the opportunity structures that are driving change in socio-technical systems? Why? might uh, the proposed change be accepted? So questions around legitimacy, so this chimes with the whole literature on institutionalization, deinstitutionalization, and how change is influenced. This is closer to uh, policy literatures, the instruments, the policy instruments uh, of, of uh, destabilization governance. And in talking about governance, uh, I, I mean, this is purposely that I'm talking about governance about not about policy, because we might see that the instruments of destabilization might extend well beyond uh, public policy instruments. And I'll come to that in a second. But linked to why, the why is it accepted and the who and what drives change? I think there's very interesting uh, ideas from political science, from Peter Hall, but then adopted for transition st studies by Florent Kern about looking uh, and again, analyzing in depth the interest ideas and in institutions behind certain action and certain uh, actors. So, what are the key issues? I've tried to list a few that I find really interesting and central uh, around the governance of destabilization. So first we can see um, different motivation for deliberate destabilization governance or phase out governance. So on the one hand, we might want to think of reactive motivations. You know, uh, the coal industry, is declining anyway for reasons that are potentially out of our control. Similarly, agricultural practices are declining uh, independently of our control. But this bears a lot of social, potentially environmental uh, costs. 
And so the motivation is to manage this decline and to minimize the vulnerabilities associated with this decline. And this we see as, as, as perhaps one of the most strongly upheld motive for a phase out uh, and destabilization governance in the public domain. Other motivations would be more, uh, what can be called more active motivations. And this is to initiate and anticipate uh, discontinuation or destabilization. Uh, you know, uh, continuing to fly as we are is running, eventually we will be running into a wall. So why not prepare this? Uh, why not uh, develop means to, in an orderly way, uh, initiate and anticipate the destabilization of this industry. Interestingly, we're seeing quite the contrary happening at the moment at the European level, uh, in France particularly as well, with the 7 billion uh, financial package uh, handed out to the uh, airline industry and aeronautic industry uh, without uh, many uh, conditions on what to do with this money. And a third kind of motivation for destabilization governance could be called more emancipatory. And here, the idea is to uh, harness transitions, to initiate transitions for very specific purposes, to transform social contracts, to instill uh, new directions uh, and ideologies, to uh, orient uh, socio-technical systems towards uh, new goals, sustainability, justice, etc. So this leads me to my second point here of normative orientations. But about this, I wanna invite you to think critically as well about uh, different kinds of normative orientations. And these are, uh, can be very varied. Uh, we might associate sustainability and justice as, as as positive, uh, good orientations, but this is a matter for ethicists to judge, not for us. Uh, the ne neoliberal destabilizations of the 80s and 90s were driven by completely different goals, uh, efficiency, uh, private ownership, for instance. Um, that doesn't make them less interesting to study uh, as long as we have an analytical apparatus to understand these as uh, normative orientations, as civilization objectives, etc., and, and, and hence to compare them with or sustainability goals. Now to the instrumentation of uh, destabilization governance. Again, I want to talk about governance and not public policy only. One might think of um, more very conventional direct uh, types of interventions, uh, regulations, bans, subsidy removals, for instance, uh, removing uh, the hidden subsidies uh, for fossil fuels, for instance. More indirect interventions that uh, are perhaps more linked to these reactive motivations, so compensations for losers uh, who might or will inevitably lose their jobs, at least temporarily, for instance, or lose their uh, um, sunk investments in infrastructure and material infrastructure. We have other kinds of inter indirect interventions, such as uh, training and reskilling uh, um, populations, workers, technicians, engineers, um, to better face uh, transitions, uh, to face impending destabilizations and to hence uh, have uh, differentiated uh, employment opportunities and, and, and hence also grease the cog as to, as to uh, in a way of saying, uh, uh, make destabilization in a way easier and faster, more acceptable. And we have all the tools of regional conversions, uh, regional transformations around, for instance, hubs. What is going to happen to the major industrial hub around Toulouse, which has been for decades uh, uh, committed to the aeronautic uh, industry once this, if this uh, industry uh, is uh, destabilized. So with this, I want to also illustrate that the governance of destabilization and the, the 
instruments of phase outs are very different from conventional innovation policy instruments. Uh, so, so this is also something to bear in mind. And the agency, the centers of power that uh, are uh, enabled or in a position to make these kinds of decisions might reside elsewhere too. A last point of governance intervention, and this is where uh, governance really takes all its meaning, is what I want to call civic types of interventions uh, by civil society uh, primarily. So here we can see protests, boycotts, opting out of particular technologies and practices, uh, divestment strategies, uh, civil disobedience, but also uh, less civil uh, uh, strategies by civil society. I mean, you could even um, look at uh, what some want to call uh, techno terrorism, uh, the sabotage of uh, pipelines or, uh, or, or, or roads uh, being one of them. So I want you to really think, uh, or us collectively, to think broadly about what destabilization governance is or may be, and, and this is what I wanted to illustrate here. So what might we uh, also analyze? I think it's very exciting to see all these missions and objectives of phase, yes? Sorry, just quickly, we're at half past two now. Um, would it be possible to wrap up in about five minutes so that we- That's exactly what I need. Perfect, thanks. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so we uh, see phase out emerging as an object of debate, of politics, of policy in the public sphere. And so here, I think it becomes important, and, and we see this for uh, increasingly over the last five years, really. Uh, and here, I think it's important to go back to uh, governance and policy literatures, uh, but also STS to understand the constitution of uh, legitimate objects of governance. The processes of des designation, translation, and problematization of certain entities in the world as matters for policy, as matters for governance. This is a stage that precedes policy formulation, as it were. We can also analyze the variety of phase-out objectives how coal phase-outs or nuclear phase-outs differ from one country to another, from one uh, social actor to another. This is also a very interesting, exciting area of study. The last point about governance, which I wanted to allude to, because I think it's a very interesting and important distinction that uh, Peter Stegmaier and colleagues, and also recently uh, my former director here, uh, Pierre-Benoît Joly, have made uh, in the DISCO project, between, on the one hand, the discontinuation of de facto governance, so the interruption of policy and governance of normal times, such as we see in times of crises uh, like today, where pretty much anything that is not COVID has vanished from the political and policy agenda. Uh, and, and this has to be distinguished, uh, they argue, from the governance of discontin discontinuation, which is, is what more what we are con concerned with. And why do they make this dis distinction? Why is it important? Is that we should not uh, be deluded in the illusion that the current interruptions of governance uh, of crisis times uh, will necessarily and without any work lead to destabilization policy or governance. And now my last, uh, I think last slide. Uh, yes, uh, having said all this, um, where do I see exciting current uh, and emerging questions for destabilization research? I think the first point is that, uh, okay, about a decade of research into destabilization within this particular commun community, but we're barely scratching the surface. Um, so an exciting area for all of us to share. Some emerging questions. Uh, so Paula Kivima and Florian Kern have uh, written this paper about policy mixes for, well, in their words, creative destruction. Uh, but the, the idea of what kind of, of policy mix, of governance mix, one uh, might uh, 
uh, decrafting or what tools are available for destabilization is very interesting. I think I've illustrated this earlier. The role of crises and destabilization and how these are not the same thing and how crises may lead to destabilization and how previous destabilization may reinforce crises when they happen is exciting and obviously very current topic of study. The role of destabilization and justice, the interactions there, obviously I've insisted on, on the losers of, of transitions and destabilization in particular. I think there are very important uh, issues of democracy, of ethics, of justice uh, and fairness here. And the current of just transitions is, is probably the best uh, equipped in our community to deal with these questions. And lastly, the question of, of the deeper structures you know, are we talking about destabilization of socio-technical systems or are we starting to envision destabilization of deeper social orders of capitalism, for instance, uh, that's Giuseppe's, uh, Feola's uh, work or deeper forms of incumbency as, as this brilliant paper by uh, Andy Sterling uh, recently made as a point. And now just to, to, to wrap up or to close, I think uh, I want, uh, to encourage all of us really to follow this injunction of Andy Sterling, who, who was my, my thesis co-supervisor with Frank Hills. I, I should have mentioned that in the beginning. And these injunctions are to keep it complex and to pluralize. Uh, and, and, and this, I think, around four elements. Pluralize the analytical entry points, look at different entities, different scales, different units. And I think I've illustrated that. Multiply, pluralize the cases and particularly look at uh, non-standard cases, not only paradigmatic uh, cases that where destabilization goes as we might expect, but also non-standard deviant cases, because these are often the ones where most uh, conceptual elaboration can stem from. Systematic comparisons, we're seeing this throughout the whole uh, field of transition studies, but I think we're now starting to see an accumulation of sufficiently enough uh, cases so that we can really start to cross compare them and, and look uh, in detail in the differences between patterns and deviations. And lastly, and, and uh, this is really to, to conclude, I think what is really exciting conceptually with destabilization is that it as most transition problems, but perhaps this one particularly so because it's such a virgin territory, it deals with some of the really the fundamental problems of social sciences, problems of structure and agency, uh, stability and change, the constitution of objects, uh, of public objects, of objects of governance. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about this area of, of study and I, I hope I've, I've conveyed this and I really encourage all of you uh, to, to well, get in there and, and contribute. So I want to thank you for your attention. I hope I've not gone way overboard in terms of time. Um, I look forward to your questions and uh, your obviously also welcome to get in touch by email after this presentation next week in a month in a year and i look forward to seeing some of you at the next ist thank you